Hello again, welcome to another episode of the Uranium Market Minute. Today is Tuesday, July 26th, and this is episode number 158. My name is Justin Hewn. I'm your host and the founder and publisher of the Uranium Insider Pro Newsletter, the only investing newsletter that focuses solely on uranium and publishes on a regular monthly basis. As always, nothing that you see or hear in this podcast is intended to be investing advice. I'm not your financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Please always do your own due diligence when it comes to investing and always take responsibility for your own choices. All right, a decent day out there, all things considered. Uh, uranium uh, outperforming broad markets slightly. URA actually flat on the day relative to the S&P that sold off over 1% on the day with the market being a bit jittery going into tomorrow's into tomorrow's um, rate hike and FOMC and Powell's presser, which everybody will be listening to. But more importantly, the Cameco conference call for Q2, which is happening tomorrow morning. I will again have the link in the description for the video in the show notes. And I uh, highly suggest that you attend this event because it's important to hear the words directly coming out of the mouths of Tim Gitzel and Grant Isaac as they field questions from, from attendees and give some guidance on what they're seeing in the uranium markets. Um, it's always an event that everyone attends in the space, and this one will be no exception. All right, relatively quiet day other than that. Um, I want to talk in the mailbag section about some whispers that we're hearing out of Germany, as well as some other developments globally having to do with this geopolitical realignment and energy crises that many countries are facing. First, let's jump right into the daily scoreboard. Spot price of uranium up another 50 cents on the day, $47 a pound mid-market. Spot still trading at too great of a discount to NAV to raise any new cash. So they're still sitting on 54.7 million in cash. However, they did trade up over 4% on the day with uranium up slightly again. So they're probably sitting right around a seven, seven and a half percent discount to their net asset value. Still very, very large, all things considered. ETFs reported no changes in outstanding shares. I would expect that on tomorrow's reporting, we'll possibly see some redemptions from URA from Friday's trading, but I could be wrong. Um, and like I said today, things firmed up a bit across the sector. So on that note, let's take a look at the charts. URA completely flat on the day with a pretty indec indecisive candle here. Um, but considering that the S&P sold off over 1%, uh, it traded up slightly during the morning hours and then sold off as the day uh, carried on. Let's look at URA relative to the S&P. Um, up 1.17% on a relative basis, back up above that trend line that we did dip down over the past couple of weeks, holding right around that area. I'm very, very pleased to see that that didn't break down further. Taking a look at Cameco going into the conference call tomorrow, up 0.7% on the day. Very, very strong considering the tape in the markets. And look at that volume. You know what this volume is probably influenced by is options trading definitely around their earnings. You see a lot of options uh, betting, really. I mean, this is gambling, trading short dated options around around conference calls. It's not my game, but um, look at that volume. That's a big jump in volume. So either the market knows something or this is options inspired volume coming from options trading prior to that conference call. That would be my bet. Very curious to see what comes out of that conference call tomorrow. Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, like I said, had a nice day, up 4.3% on the day. Still institutional volume, not there. Still not there. Um, when risk comes back on, do I expect to see bigger volumes coming into this vehicle? Yes, I absolutely do. Lastly, let's look at URNM, again, relative to spot price of uranium. Hanging in there slightly down on the day with the spot price bumping up a little bit, but this chart is definitely firming up. Somewhat of a double bottom here as we hit this trend line, excuse me, at this horizontal uh, point of previous resistance on multiple occasions. We did fill the gap from last uh, December, and we are slightly above those levels at the beginning of the bull market. Looking, uh, obviously, in a bull market for any commodity, you want to see the equities outperform the commodity itself, which is typically the type of leverage that the miners give you in a commodities bull market. And we would really like to see this chart firm up and become bullish again. What makes this a bullish chart? Uh, increased volume and trading back above a rising 200-day moving average. All right. So that's really what we're looking for here. All right. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of points in the mailbag section today that um, I think that there's a number of elements 
geopolitically that are influencing nuclear policy in a number of different countries. One uh, has to do with the geopolitical realignment that's currently happening that is being um, very largely influenced by the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and the way that the countries are responding to that action. So we've seen most of the countries in the West take some sort of sanctions of various forms against Russia. We are seeing countries try to um, increase their, their own sovereignty going forward, considering that Russia is such a huge, huge player in the global commodities trade. They are major, they the largest exporter of wheat. They are the largest, if not one of the largest exporters of oil. Um, and obviously we talk about a lot on this channel um, that they are the largest players in the conversion and enrichment space for the uranium fuel cycle. They're also big exporters of fertilizers. So um, this has really big impacts on the entire planet. And there's, we're seeing a lot of countries kind of rethink policies, considering how different the world is in this current state than it was even six months ago. So what have we seen since um, earlier this year that has really firmed up? Recently, we've heard Belgium, they're moving to get 10-year plant life extensions for two of their nuclear reactors. Now, just last year, Belgium was uh, planning on, on phasing out nuclear. This is a total 180 coming from Belgium. So you know what? Hooray, Belgium. Great job. Uh, thank you for letting logic uh, persist and win out in this particular situation. Your people need energy. You want to lessen that uh, reliance on any other countries, let alone uh, a country that you might consider uh, being a political enemy currently with what's happening in the Ukraine. Okay, going forward, what else? The UK, as I mentioned a few days ago, has given the approval to develop the Sizewell C plant. This is a biggie. This is 3.2 gigawatts. It's a very, very large reactor. Um, this is a, a fantastic piece of news. And obviously the UK also wants to do the same thing. This is really something that nuclear can help um, countries develop going forward, which is sovereignty, energy sovereignty. And why is that? Because even if a country um, does not produce any uranium or necessarily any other elements of the fuel cycle, now Uranco, um, had the, you know, the, there's enrichment on that side of things, but uh, you know, the UK, they're not mining uranium, right? But with nuclear energy, you can store an immense amount of fabricated fuel and other elements of the fuel cycle, but you can store fabricated fuel on site that will power that reactor for years and years and years and years in a small, in a relatively small amount of space to store that fuel. This is such a big advantage for nuclear. This is why nuclear makes so much sense for Japan. My next point, what has Japan stated over the past few months? Their new prime minister, continues to emphasize the importance of nuclear in their energy mix going forward. Now, I'll reiterate these numbers. Japan has restarted 10 reactors, a total of 10 reactors since Fukushima. Around five of those is currently offline um, due to maintenance issues, uh, potentially due to refueling outages. And the prime minister wants at least nine of those uh, up and running. So four more of those that are currently offline, but technically restarted back up and running by the wintertime. And what else has uh, Japan stated? They want nuclear to make up 20 to 22% of the entire energy mix by 2030. At the current level of energy production in the country of Japan, that would mean another 20 plus reactors restarted by 2030. Now 2030 at this point is seven and a half years away. Um, this is really not that far away when it comes to big movements like this in terms of restarting reactors. And Japan has um, north of a dozen that are in the restarting process that are somewhere along that phase. They have an 11th reactor that is going to start up um, in Q1 or Q2 next year. Very, very good to see. Last point, Germany looks like it's highly likely they're going to fold on those last three plants that remain operating now. They had re, uh, previously planned to shut these down in December and be done with nuclear. They would have zero remaining nuclear plants. So there's three more currently operating. It looks like under immense pressure from the public and from uh, just you know geopolitically around the world about their energy policy, especially as I mentioned yesterday, this act of desperation, essentially begging the surrounding countries to reduce their gas consumption so that they can have a little bit more. Well, you know what, Germany, you're going to be begging other countries to reduce their own consumption of energy. How about you make a, a logical decision to keep your plants online? So that is looking highly likely to happen. Now, today, we are just hearing... And of course, this is just kind of whispers and rumors. 
that it's possible that they could even restart some of the plants they decommissioned, okay, or that they had shut off recently. I shouldn't say decommissioned. So three reactors had been shut down last December. It's my understanding that one of those three has been decommissioned to the point where it would be difficult, if not impossible, to restart the, that reactor. Maybe impossible is not the right word, but at least difficult, costly, and unlikely. Um, I, I can't confirm that. I'm not a nuclear engineer, but uh, it looks to me that two of those three could still very easily be restarted, and we do know now that they can get the fuel for three of the reactors are currently currently running and could probably get the fuel for restarting two as well. So they have the capacity to do this. Of course, that would be a huge sign if they did and a very, very good thing for the German people and for the rates that they're paying for electricity going forward. Um, so this, this whole situation in the Ukraine is really highlighting the fragility of the energy grids in many, many different countries. And it's obviously some of those countries are reacting to this. This is a very good sign for nuclear going forward. Um, and the setup just continues to grow and continues to be more and more supportive of this vital energy source in the world that we're living in now and the world that looks like we will be living in the future. Clean energy, baseload power, uh, safe and increasingly affordable on a relative basis. Um, the cheap costs of solar energy over the past couple of decades has come from, um, I mean, let's just be frank, essentially what is a, you know tantamount to slave labor in China. Um, you know, that really has influenced the extremely low prices of solar. And of course, you can't compare solar to a baseload power on a, uh, you know, megawatt to megawatt basis. You have to compare it to, uh, you, you have to factor in the fact that um, if you don't have the storage for, for the solar energy that's generated during the day, you can't really count that on a 100% basis. Um, or even a 90% basis, like many of the nuclear reactors actually run, you know, 85, 90% capacity factor. So um, comparing all of these elements, it really is lining up fantastically for nuclear. And I've gone ad nauseum in previous episodes about the setup and the fuel cycle. I'm not going to talk about that right now. So um, if you happen to be able to attend last week's members webinar, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, this setup is fantastic. So tomorrow's a big day with the FOMC, um, the official rate hike coming from the Fed. And most importantly, of course, the tone and the actual statements coming from Jay Powell. Um, but you know what? Focusing more, um, myself will be on the Cameco call and what they are stating. Um, there's plenty going on with that company. They are really in a, in a fantastic position here, all things considered with what's happening in the world right now. So I expect to hear probably a very excited tone, especially from Grant Isaac. Tim Gitzel seems to be very kind of emotionally flat um, quarter over quarter, he just kind of gets the um, gets the basics out there. Talks about ESG, talks about how they're operating, blah 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 blah. And then Grant Isaac comes in, and he usually comes out swinging, um, especially with what's happening right now. So, I I strongly think that uh, whether or not they discuss further contracts inked, you have to understand that a company and or a utility, even if they're not under an NDA, which most of the time they are. Um, they, they can't discuss the, the, the amount of pounds signed in these contracts until they are literally signed. So if Cameco has a dozen discussions currently ongoing with utilities, U.S. and otherwise, um, they can't really talk about that other than in very, very vague terms. But I do expect them to say that they are getting further um, increased attention in terms of signing more long-term contracts. And it's likely they will sign more in Q3 and Q4 going forward. Once we have US utilities uh, new budgets in October 1, and once the utilities have a better idea of the conversion and enrichment capacity for the periods of time that they are uncovered for that fuel. So you have to go out 2024, 2025, half of the US fleet is, under, is uncovered in terms of their nuclear fuel requirements uh, in 2025 going forward, and that only grows. EU is better covered. They start to get slightly uncovered during that time period. Um, you go out three or four years past that, they get down to that 40 to 50% uncovered level as well. So um, we are right on the cusp and in the early stages of this uh, contracting cycle that is happening just under our feet right now. Very, very exciting times, especially with the backdrop of the broad, of the broad market and all the geopolitical tension. Oh gosh, um, uh, wavering economies, food crises. It's just, you can't keep up with it all. But um, nuclear looks like it is one place that uh, one of many places, but it definitely is one of, in my opinion, the strongest theses out there for 
um, having material support coming from the markets in the years coming. All right. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. I do appreciate you all. Appreciate you all and I will see you again tomorrow. Take care. Cheers.